Hello, and welcome back to Feeding His Sheep. Today we're going to conclude our study with the second half of Mark chapter 11. Now in our last study, we started to see a dramatic shift in the public ministry of Jesus. For years, he has told the people not to tell anyone who he is, so as not to stir up trouble with the Pharisees who were constantly trying to have him killed. When he would cast out demons and the demons would begin to shriek and cry out, we know who you are, the Holy One of God, he would command them to be silent. That's under Understandable. Who would want the testimony of a demon anyway? After the Lord Jesus cured a man of leprosy, he said to that man, See you tell no man, but go your way, show yourself to the, pre to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. After he cured two blind men, Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. When Peter had his greatest moment, he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It says in the scriptures, Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man. When he was transfigured before them, as they came down the mountain, he gave orders to them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. It was simply not his time. Some wanted him to liberate them from Rome. His mission was to liberate us from our sin. Some wanted to force him to become their king. Now he's going to set up his kingdom in the future when the real triumphal entry occurs, when he returns on a white horse in power and glory with millions of his redeemed behind him. Some of the religious leaders there wanted him dead. He had said many times that he was going to die for us and he would be raised up. It just wasn't the appointed time back then. But now it's time. It's God's time. In our last study, we covered how everything was going to be fulfilled according to God's timing as prophesied. According to Daniel 9, 483 years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given, Messiah would come into the city. He was praised and celebrated in the streets of the city, just as Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26 said, nearly word for word. Then he rode into the city in the exact manner that God had predicted back in Zechariah. Zechariah 9 9 on the colt on the full of a donkey. On the next day, he's going to perform yet another cleansing of the temple and yet more prophecies of old. In Psalm 69, verse 9, it says, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And then he also fulfills a part of Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3. I'll share that with you right quick. Behold, I'm going to send my message and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them with gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. And his upcoming death is going to be right on God the Father's schedule. Jesus is the fulfillment of the long-awaited and celebrated Passover lamb. He is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And his death is to occur on the Passover at the very hour the Passover lambs were to be slain in the temple. And where we are in the text is around Tuesday of the very week that this is going to happen, his final week. And the glove are off with the Pharisees. There is no more hiding his identity. We covered in our last study, he arrived in Jerusalem and the crowd declared him as a Messiah by their words and their actions. The Pharisees tell him to rebuke their disciples as they were saying these things. And Jesus told them if they were to be silent, the rocks would cry out these things. So the events and the teachings that occur during the Passover week are going to so upset the religious leaders that they're going to stop at nothing to see him dead. They will overcome their fear of the crowds and they will actually be okay with holding an illegal trial to convict him and have him killed as soon as possible, even during a feast, which was not acceptable either. But it will be right on time, down to the very hour at three o'clock on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. Now let us get into the text and see what happens to push the Pharisees even further into a murderous rage. In 
in Mark chapter 11, we'll begin with verses 12 through 14. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. You know, sometimes we focus so much on the deity of Christ that we forget about the humanity. He was 100% God, but yet at the same time, 100% man. He felt hunger, as verse 12 says. He felt thirst. He felt rejection. And we should never forget that he felt every single thing about the crucifixion. May that never leave our mind. Now, this event takes us to the day after the triumphal entry. On the way into the city, make and another trip in, this strange thing happens with the fig tree. And I say it's strange for multiple reasons. For one, have you noticed this is the only destructive miracle that we see in Scripture? Every time he has used divine power before, it was to heal somebody to do something positive. This time, something is being destroyed. Now, if you're like me, this raises many questions. Number one, why did he become upset with the tree for not having figs when the Bible says it wasn't the season for figs? And the second question I have is why did he take the time to kill the tree instead of just going on? And another question might be why is this seemingly small thing recorded in the Bible? The purpose is to teach those that were present then and those reading it today, a very important lesson. To begin with, let's understand something about fig trees. I didn't know recently that fig trees don't bloom as the bloom is actually inside the fruit itself. We actually have a couple of them. My wife has one out here in the garden, and I had to go out and see a fruit, a fig tree by myself to understand if all these things are true, such as the fact that the leaves and the fruit grow at the same time. This is how you know when figs are growing on the tree, because the leaves begin to appear at the same time that the figs do. I had never known that, and I had to go outside and see to it for myself. Now, doing some research, I found that sometimes something natural can cause a fruitless fig tree to have leaves but no figs. Things like an unusually high amount of nitrogen in the soil, that can cause this rare growth of only leaves but no fruit. That may have been the case here, but who knows? But I suspect that maybe this tree was allowed to grow leaves without fruit for the sole purpose of this illustration and this teachable moment. Some people today, they're going to get upset about the destruction of an innocent tree for the purpose of an illustration or teaching something. How is that any different than the traditions of cutting down Christmas trees or a child pulling flowers out of the ground and plucking dandelions? I don't understand how people can get so upset over a tree dying, but in the same time, they're okay with unborn babies being slaughtered in the womb. That makes no sense to me whatsoever when we value other things that creation more than human life. But that's a, a discussion for another time. This was a teachable moment for the disciples, and it's a prophecy of judgment against the nation of Israel and her religious leadership. And it's also a warning for those who name the name of Christ today. This judgment against the tree was not for failing to bear fruit out of season, but for it going against its design and giving the impression that it was time to bear fruit because it had leaves. Remember, the fruit accompanies the leaves on a fig tree. The Bible said it wasn't the season for figs, so this tree shouldn't have even had leaves. It was, in a sense, being deceptive by giving the impression that it bore fruit when it was actually fruitless. Again, that's nothing against the tree. Maybe it's something that caused it naturally, as we spoke of earlier, but maybe God had just placed it there for this reason. It's a lesson, a judgment, and a warning are all going to come out of this. The lesson for the disciples and us is going to be about praying with faith. They will come up, that will come up at the end of this study when we see that the tree really did wither and die in a single day. But we'll get into that more when we get there. This kind of sandwiched in between the, the lesson on 
on faith in between the cursing of the fig tree and the withering of the fig tree. The judgment part is also coming up in the dealing with the religious leaders and those that are defiling the temple in the next part of Scripture. But the warning is there for us today from this event, not only for the religious leaders of that day who are deceiving the people, but many today who name the name of Christ do the same thing. The tree spread its leaves to make everybody think that it was bearing fruit when it wasn't. Many people today pretend to have fruit when there is none there. I'm talking about people not just out of church, but people in church today. They profess that they're very religious, but their lives are fruitless. Or maybe they appear leafy in church, they have a good appearance, but once they leave the building, they live a fruitless life. Christ saw the hypocrisy in the leaders of the temple and in the synagogues. They made great professions of holiness. They put on the appearance of godliness in public, but in their hearts and their actions, there was no sign of the fruit of righteousness. The leaders within the temple, they should have been ready for Messiah. The nation was blessed with the privilege of the prophecies about him and the promises of his arrival. But when he did arrive, right on schedule according to the prophecies that they were given, they rejected him. It was not. It was the appointed time and the season, and they were covered in leaves and appearing fruitful, but on the inside they were not. Now Jesus is coming back again soon, at any moment. It could be today, who knows? And just like in the first century, the world is full of people who are bearing many leaves, but they have no fruit. Many people sit in churches and they sing the songs and they sit through countless sermons. They bear the finest leaves. You would look at that person and say, there sits a super saint right there. Or maybe they just sit there the whole time in church and they're thinking about what they're going to do after church is over. What are they going to have for lunch? And while the singing is going on, their mind is somewhere else. During the sermon, you know, they're sleeping, drawing stuff during the reading and study of God's Word. The leaves are there, but they're not not fooling anybody, and they're especially not fooling God. But as we see in this event with the fig tree, God doesn't care about your leaves. He cares about your fruit. He doesn't care about your appearance or any motions that you go through in church and trying to appear holy and righteous. He cares about you being real. He wants to see you bear fruit. The day of Jesus' real triumphal entry is coming. We're just waiting on a trumpet blast. And those who are bearing fruit for him and for the kingdom, we're going to be out of here. But that also means that we all need to examine ourselves. If Jesus were to come today or this week, or if you were going to die, whichever comes first, either way, you're going to stand before the Lord. Is he going to find any fruit on you? Are you participating in the kingdom? Are you serving God in any way, shape, or form? Are you faithfully praying and studying your Bible? Now, of course, we all have room for improvement on that. No matter how much you pray, how much you study your Bible, there's always room for more. But are you at least doing it regularly? Are you loving those around you? Or are you just wearing leaves? Are you pretending to be a Christian? Are you saved or are you self-deceived? At the end of this study, we're going to see what happened to the tree for being fruitless. The consequences for people who claim the name of Christ but do not truly know Him, commune with Him, worship Him, and actively seek to serve Him will see the same fate. That is a warning directed to all of us, directly from our Savior. Do not take this lightly. Let's go on into verses 15 through 19. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. The chief priest and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they would go out of the city. 
As you'll remember, this is the second time that you will find in the Gospels that Jesus flips the tables and drives out those who have turned the place of worship into a place of business. This was foretold earlier, as I mentioned in the Psalms and Malachi 3. I wanted to say, though, before we go any further, this shows the sovereignty and the power of Christ. In our last study, we estimated there's somewhere between, what, two and three million people who had made the pilgrimage and the journey to Jerusalem for the Passover as required by law. I know that they could not all fit into the city and the temple at one time, but you know it had to be full of people. On top of the crowds, there's multiple religious leaders and temple employees that were constantly there. It took a multitude of people to sacrifice the annual quarter million amount of lambs being presented. That takes a lot of work. And then there's also the temple police. According to the Midrash, Levites were stationed at 21 points in the temple court, and at three of them, priests also kept watch during the night. A captain was also assigned to patrol with a lantern to see that the watchmen were at their post. If one of the watchmen was found sleeping, the captain had a right to beat him and to set fire to his garments. They took security seriously. The opening and the closing of the gates, according to Josephus' writings, required at least 20 men, which was also one of the watchmen's duties, and a special officer was also added to that to supervise this work. Out of all of these people present, all of this security, all of the temple police, nobody tried to stop Jesus. Did you ever think of that? One solitary man is cleansing the temple and running people out of there, and no one stopped him. Now, let us get to the reason why he drove those people out. You know, it all started as a practical and a good idea. Many of these people traveling great distances, they're going to find it hard to make a journey of several miles while herding these animals that are supposed to be sacrificed and offered. So the idea of buying the required animals once they got to Jerusalem was implemented. It's a good idea. You don't have to travel a hundred and something miles with your livestock. Just carry money with you and then purchase them when you get there and present them at the temple. That's all fine and dandy, but then corruption sets into this idea. The priest began to see a way that they could make money out of this. So they would start charging more than the animal was actually worth in a fair market. And on top of that, they had a new plan. They started to reject the animals that the people were bringing from home, calling them unacceptable for whatever reason they could find. That way, they could sell in the animals that they had there. What were the people going to do? Make a another round trip home to try yet another animal, only to have that one rejected by these greedy priests again? You know, this is the same principle that the movie theaters use. Any outside food or drink is forbidden in a movie theater so that you have to buy snacks from their concession stands at, you know, more than fair prices. I should say, maybe I need to bring a whip with me the next time I go to the movies and start flipping tables. $50 for a box of popcorn and pop for three people? Come on. No, don't do that and get me into trouble. It's their place of business, their rules. But the temple of God belonged to God, but the people had turned it into a place of business, their business, and a corrupt business at that. So look again how Jesus described them in verse 17. Is it not written, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a robber's den? Besides their corrupt animal selling business, the money exchange had become corrupt. The priest in the temple had made it a rule that they're only going to accept one kind of currency for any monetary offerings or for the purchase of any animals that they bought for sacrifice in the temple. You know, there were other offerings that were monetary that were brought annually. For example, every Jewish male was required by law once a year to pay what is called the temple tax. It amounted to about two days wages. Now, this was a legitimate requirement. It was in God's law. However, their requirements that it may, may be made in a specific currency, a certain type of coin, 
was not legitimate. That was never commanded by God. They had adopted a foreign coin called the Tyrian shekel. Now, there were four kinds of coins used in that day, five if you count the widow's mite. There is the Phoenician shekel, a half shekel, a Jewish Hasmonean lepton, and a Roman denarius. But they had made it to where only one of those, the Tyrian shekel, was the only one acceptable. Shekels of Tyre were the only currency that they would accept at the Jerusalem temple, and it's probably even the same coins that Judas was paid off for the betrayal of Christ. If they came there with any other currency, they'd gladly sell you the acceptable coins for a profit. What was originally a practical idea was corrupted by greed. Later, it became blasphemous as they decided it's okay to go ahead and move their ludicrous business inside the temple. This is why Jesus couldn't stand to see God's house become this way. By driving them out, he's not only pronouncing judgment on those doing the trading, but also judgment on the wicked priest who not only allowed this to happen, but encouraged it to happen so that they could make a profit. And as you can guess, this didn't sit well with the priest. Not only did Jesus present himself as Messiah when he entered the city on the previous day, now he was in a sense making himself Lord over the temple. Jesus was starting to show the authority that was rightfully his as the Son of God. This was the authority that the priest and the Pharisees thought belonged to them. So their murderous rage against Jesus increased a vast amount that day. As the text we just read says, they began seeking how they may destroy him. But it is not his time to die yet. The Passover is still just a couple days away. Before the, before the feast would be a legitimate time, for them to have him killed, but the crowds kept them at bay. And the fact that Jesus returned to Bethany each night, as verse 19 said, it's not time for him to be taken just yet. Almost, but not yet. Let's go ahead and get verses 20 through 26. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be answered to you. And then in 25 and 26, he says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. On the next day's trip into the journey, Peter just happened to look over and to see the fig tree from the previous day, and you can hear the excitement and the surprise in his voice as he proclaimed, Look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered. After seeing several people healed of blindness and infirmities, thousands of demons cast out, lives transformed, people being raised from the dead, even these seemingly small miracles did not go unnoticed by the disciples. And you have to admit, usually plants and trees don't die that fast, unless I plant them. The the best poisons and weed killers out there may advertise that there will be visible results within 24 hours, but it's more like a couple days. And even then, it only begins with slight discoloration of the leaves. This plant was not lit withering beginning with the leaves, as he read in the scripture, but from the roots up. I've cut up many trees in the past, clearing land and cutting firewood, and I know that sometimes those roots can remain for many years unless you burn them out. But this plant must have died the second that it was cursed because its decay began extremely rapidly, supernaturally rapid. But remember earlier, one of the reasons I said why he cursed the tree was to symbolize the judgment against the nation who were not faithful. When it mentioned that it was withered from the roots up, that brings to mind something that John the Baptist had said about the religious establishment just a few years prior to this. When the Pharisees came 
came out to hear him as he baptized people, he called them a brood of vipers and asked them who warned them to flee the judgment that was to come. But then he said this in Matthew 3.10, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Israel's long-awaited Messiah has arrived. Prophecy has been fulfilled. Prophecy that they should have recognized, but it's prophecy that they rejected, rejecting the Messiah in the very process. Soon, Jesus is going to lay down his life as a sacrifice for us. And within a period of about 40 years, not one stone is going to be left upon another in their precious temple, exactly as Jesus said. It was in A.D. 70 that it was burned and dismantled stone by stone to receive to retrieve the melted gold that had seeped in between the stones. But Jesus turns this around in a different direction. Peter showed amazement at this miracle that can also be used to us for another teachable moment. He uses this moment to show them that faith-filled prayer can do many things that seem impossible. But there are so many people out there, they'll misquote this verse and they'll twist it about faith being able to move mountains. And I'm sure if Jesus prayed that, it would happen. Years ago, I saw a movie that had Jim Carrey in it called Bruce Almighty. I don't recommend it at all. In fact, I didn't even realize that the country of Egypt had actually banned the movie because of its blasphemous betrayal of God. But there was one lesson that can be gleaned from it, and I'll spare you from having to see it yourself and just tell you the lesson that I learned from it. In the movie, the main character criticized the way that God was running the world. So he was given a chance by God to try and run the universe himself. Now, he does weird things like moving the moon closer for a better view, and in turn, he wrecks the planet. The tides of the ocean are affected by the moon, and there's many other factors that changed the world and brought about its ruin. You know, God is God, and we are not. He placed mountains where they are for a reason. If we were actually able to move them by prayer, look at the damage that we would cause to the delicate ecosystem and the many other problems. Moving mountains was a popular figure of speech for any insurmountable problem. Jesus said that as we believe, God could overcome any obstacle. Even things that seemed impossible by human standards could be done through faith in God. I like what Pastor David Guzik from Enduring Word Ministries said about this. He said, This does not mean if you pray hard enough and really believe that God is obligated to answer your prayer no matter what you ask. That kind of faith is not faith in God. Rather, it is nothing but faith in faith. Now, is God able to do anything we pray for Him to do? Yes. Will God do everything we ask Him to do? It depends. For one thing, what we are asking for must be His will. Peter and the disciples did not want Jesus to die. Jesus Himself prayed, If it is possible, may this cup be passed from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Had Jesus not died on that cross as the disciples wanted, we would still be lost in our sin. You and I would be on a road headed straight to hell. Just like the song by Garth Brooks, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. But in reality, no prayer is truly unanswered. Sometimes that answer is no, and it's for a good reason. We should pray, and we should pray with the faith that God is able to do whatever task that we ask of Him. But we should also not expect God to do something that is against His will and His plan for our lives. He may have something better in store for us than whatever it is that we might be asking for. But there's also something else that affects the answer to receive prayer. And Jesus addressed that in the last two verses that we read there. Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Sometimes our prayers can be hindered because of unforgiveness. I've heard of people say, well, I forgive old so-and-so, but I'm never going to forget what they did. You know, more than just effective prayer depends on our forgiving others. Our own forgiveness depends on 
forgiving others as well. And I think even the most seasoned believer needs to be reminded of that fact from time to time. Right after teaching the disciples about prayer for the very first time, Jesus made that condition crystal clear. In Matthew 6, he gave us what we call as the Lord's Prayer, but in verses in 14 and 15, immediately after that, he said, For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. How are you going to feel if you stand before God and he said to you, Well, I would forgive you, but I haven't forgotten what you've done. You know, that should help us rearrange our prideful priorities and fully forgive and forget what others have done to us. You know, we're not without sin ourselves, so we cannot hold a grudge against those who also have sinned against us. Forgive others. Seventy times seven, if that is what's necessary. Forgive others as your forgiveness depends on it, because it does. And if it seems as if a certain prayer of yours keeps going unanswered, ask yourself if it could possibly be what God wants for you. You know, it could be that you're praying for something that is out of God's will. And then examine your heart. See if there's any grudges in there that you haven't fully dealt with that could be hindering your prayer. In your Bible, you may have noticed that verse 26 was in brackets. It was not part of the original manuscripts, but it was later added in by scribes. But the verse is biblical itself, as Jesus addressed this same issue in great detail early in his ministry. In Matthew 5, verses 22 and 23, he says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, in verse 24 he says, Leave your offering there before the altar, and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So let's move on to these last verses of chapter 11, verses 27 through 33. They came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and the elders came to him and began saying to him, By what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do these things? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, and you answer me, and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. They began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Then why did you not believe him? But if we shall say from men, for they were afraid of the people, for everyone considered John to have been a real prophet. Answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. On the surface, this looks like yet another attempt by the Pharisees and religious leaders to attempt to trap Christ. In a way, it is, but it's more like an open interrogation of his recent behavior. They think that they have more than enough evidence here to take him and kill him that very day, but there are still a few days remaining until the appointed time. They ask him who gave him the authority to do the things that he has done in these past few days, putting on a display within the city that points to him as being the Messiah of prophecy, driving out those conducting business in the temple, and then preaching against the religious establishment. They considered themselves to be the religious authority, and they certainly did not approve of him doing these things, so they didn't give him the authority, much less they would never give him permission to do that in the first place. Then if he had claimed that he had gotten the authority from man, he could be charged with usurping the established authority of those appointed to serve in the temple temple. If he claimed that he was given the authority from God, they could take him immediately for blasphemy. Even though he would be correct in claiming the authority from God, the fact that they didn't believe it, they would kill him for blasphemy. But he cannot be taken and killed before the appointed time. Neither can Jesus be untruthful and lie about his divine authority. So they think that they finally got him trapped. If he says that we gave him the authority, he's lying and can be arrested. If he said God gave him the authority, we'll claim blasphemy 
blasphemy on him. They think they've got him trapped. But you know, the money changers' tables weren't the only things flipped that day. He flipped the tables of their own argument against them. And he told them he would answer their question if they answered his first. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And I love his assertiveness as he added, answer me, right at the end of asking that question. The gloves are off with these guys. It's all out on the table now. This is like a shootout from the OK Corral in the old Western movies. They know if they say that John's ministry and baptism is from God, they're going to have to admit that Jesus is as well. And they don't want to do that. I think they know deep down that Jesus is from God, but their hard hearts and their stubbornness will not let them accept that. All too often today, the same scene plays out. People have more than enough evidence that the Bible is true. They have all the evidence they need that Jesus and judgment are real, but they still demand more evidence. They demand to see a sign. But even if they were given more evidence and more signs, it would never be enough. And to those people, I say, do you really think that you're somebody that special, that God needs to prove himself more than he already has? You know, the Pharisees also knew that if they said that John's ministry was of man, they're going to face the wrath of the people. The people embraced John and believed him, and so far they do Jesus in the same manner. That should be a warning for all clergy and church leaders today. Don't let public trends and fear of public opinion sway you from the truth. Now, the Pharisees were in the wrong here, but the church today seems to be silent when public opinion sides with sin on controversial issues. The leaders want to be popular. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to upset anyone. They don't want to offend anyone, so they embrace sinful doctrines themselves to their eventual and eternal ruin. So the leaders only had one possible answer. They turned to Jesus and said, I don't know. Funny how even small children use that excuse, isn't it? They never know who made the best mess in the bathroom. Who scattered toys all over the floor? I don't know. Who set your little sister on fire? I don't know. Does this stuff only happen in my house, or do y'all have children the same way? Anyway, by claiming they didn't know, these religious leaders disqualified themselves from any religious authority. They gave up any claims that they had. Their attempt to discredit him had backfired, and they had publicly admitted that they were not competent to judge a clear and very important case concerning religious authority. So Jesus wins yet again against their schemes. But does it convince his enemies? No. All it does is add fuel to the fire of their hatred and ensures that his death would be soon, right on God's schedule.